Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Mark Hurst, the founder of Creative Good and the host of the radio show and podcast, Tectonic. I have been in the online ecosystem, I guess you could say, for about 30 years. Um, I left school in 95 to join a small startup run by Seth Godin. Some of your listeners will recognize that name uh, as he started a company called Yoyodyne that he later sold to Yahoo. I was there for about a year and a half doing early online product development with um, things like email and websites, which were <laughs> pretty brand new at that point. And then in 97, I left to start the company that I still run, it's called Creative Good. And uh, Creative Good is a consulting firm and a, what I call a creative platform that has allowed me to launch a bunch of projects over the years. But the, the consulting that I still do is advising teams on how to make digital products better for the customers, better for the users. And for a number of years, that went really well. I had a team um, in, in an office in Midtown, New York, and we were working with Fortune 500 companies, and it was going great. And around about the early 2010s, I noticed that things started to change in that companies were a little bit less interested in finding out what customers wanted in order to make something good for them. And some companies began to be more interested in tricking customers and manipulating them and fooling them into doing things that were not in the customer's long-term best interest. Well, I was offended and horrified, and I still am, uh, 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 by this practice. And I saw it become uh, more and more prevalent as the tech industry consolidated into four or five giant monopolies that made use of these dark patterns and these tricks. And so in response to that change, even though I continued, there are, there are companies and teams that still come and find me and um, they've read my book. I wrote a book called Customers Included about this method and they want to they practice this method in their product development. I'm happy to work with, with any team that is interested. But in response to seeing this, this larger consolidation of the tech industry into these um, companies engaged in unethical practices, I did two things. First, I started a radio show, which I know we'll talk about. It's called Tectonic, and it's broadcast out of WFMU, which is a free-form independent station in Jersey City, New Jersey. It's a, it's a weekly talk show about technology. And the other thing I did is I started a private members only online community where colleagues and I could discuss what was happening in tech, uh, not on Twitter or any of those services where you can get trolls or whatever. This is a paid online community. So it's, it's very, very high signal to noise. And it's a way for me to organize my thoughts as I see this fire hose of, of news coming in every day about what these companies are doing. And so that's helped me, both the radio show and the, the online community called the Creative Good Forum uh, have helped me gain a, gain a handle on what's happening, all these very fast changes that have come at us over the past few years. So that's what I spend my time on, radio, the Creative Good Forum, and my consulting projects at Creative Good. Got it. That is, um, and again, we've known each other a long time. And so I've watched your career and, and really um, value the perspective you bring because Thank uh, you. there's a lot to be critical of. You know, there's a lot of benefits to technology, but clearly there are downside risks. And, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about those uh, because most of the time on most media, it's all about the positives. And, and I think we need to focus on some of those negative concerns. Um, you know, that's an important point. That's a really important point that is lost on some people. I'm glad you brought it up, Jim. A lot of 
tech coverage tends to be positive. And some, not all, but some of the people who are giving this positive coverage do it in order to maintain their access to sources inside the big monopolies. And so you can kind of understand why they gloss over any of the negatives. For me, though, I'm completely independent. Um, WFMU, on, on, the, on, on my radio show, we are not affiliated with any university. We're not an NPR affiliate. We don't take any ads. There are no underwriting breaks. There's no one outside the station to please. So I'm able to say what I think is the truth. And so I don't spend any airtime in, in fatuous praise of, of whatever the latest Google phone is or something. I have no interest in that. What I'm interested in is what are the real effects that these companies and their products are having on us? And it, it ends up being negative quite often, um, but I feel like that's, that's necessary to tell the truth and also to counterbalance the, the giant wave of, of, of hollow positivity that comes out of most tech media every day. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, we've come so far over the past 15, 20 years, right? It's just, uh, it's just amazing. Um, and again, a lot of great stuff, but fairly negative side effects. Um, and you talk about those on your, on your radio show. And I just want, want to let folks know, is that uh, where can they find that? And is it also podcasted or streamed or where are the other out, where are the outlets that people can find what you're talking about? Okay. Good question. First of all, it is a podcast. The podcast is just a podcast recording of the live radio show. So it's, you get the same material either way. Um, there's also online archives that you can stream, same exact shows. And there's also the live FM uh, broadcast. So where I direct people to go is a, a one-page website, tectonic.fm. That's T-E-C-H tonic.fm. It's a little bit like shifting tectonic plates, but you add an H in there to make it T-E-C-H uh, tonic. And that that page, tectonic.fm, uh, has links to the podcast. It has links to the uh, each of the shows. I put in links so you can go to the streaming archive exactly when the interview starts. So you can skip over all of my intro stuff if you want to do that. <laughs> and there are also links to the episode pages where there are links where I've put uh, typically uh, a dozen or more uh, links to news stories and pointers to the guests right. work and their listener comments as well so it's a it's a real wealth of information covering every conceivable tech topic uh, over the past six years so right. go forth and listen to over 300 hours of wow. me complaining about tech <laughs> uh, that, that's great now uh, let me ask you this though is it also on any of the platforms any of the podcast platforms just because people are used to that and, and if not why well, sure. I'm, you can find it on iTunes. Um, okay. And that, that link is on tectonic.fm. It says, here's the iTunes pod, uh, podcast link. The show is the official name, I think, is Tectonic with Mark Hurst. Uh, because uh, a, a year or two after I started my show, uh, the Financial Times decided to start their own podcast called Tectonic. Amazing that they didn't think to do a search if anyone else had already been using that name. Anyway, uh, yeah, so Tectonic with Mark Hurst. But if someone does not want to use a Monopoly uh, podcast platform and they want to use an RSS reader, for example, maybe you, you use uh, NetNewsWire or Vienna, or there's a number of RSS readers that will save you from having to use the um, Monopolist Apple podcast app, there's an RSS feed as well. Okay, uh, and what about total... Spotify? What about Spotify? Is it there? You know, I don't use Spotify, um, so I don't even know if it's there. It might, it might be on it there. It might be, okay. I, I, uh, but I'm not sure. But I, I recommend that people get off Spotify. So I don't recommend that people look me up there. I recommend that people cancel their accounts. Okay, got it. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone knew how to how to get to the content and the platform that you uh, the community you run is that on. Um, 
any, uh, is that custom made? I'm just curious how you made that platform or whether you use something off the shelf. Yeah, so this is the Creative Good Form. This is something that I run. Um, you can get to it from creativegood.com. And a few years ago when I was looking around for ways to, to start an online community, I looked at the available uh, platforms. And a lot of them are um, their proprietary code. A lot of them are owned or, or heavily leveraged by venture capitalists. So you know they're just going to they're going to go bad at some point. But I found a platform called Discourse. And I want to say that carefully, Discourse. It, this is not Discord, it's Discourse. And Discourse is open source. It's free. Uh, they do have hosting options for pay if you want them to host your uh, Discourse instance. But I was able to download the code and and host it um, at a at a hosting company I've used for years and so I, I have my own local instance of discourse running so it's open source code there's as far as I know there's no surveillance there are no hooks to Google Facebook or the other uh, surveillance monopolists and I've been very happy with it it's a it, it's, it's a giant discussion board basically it has categories and it'll send you email updates and stuff. But basically, it's a discussion board, and it's been um, it's been really good at at as as I said before, organizing the the influx of of news and comment about tech into a very readable uh, interface. Got it. Um, so again, so much to talk about. Let's just start with some history, right? And then we'll bring it up to sort of where we are now. CES just happened. That's something we can talk about products. And of course, AI is a huge uh, topic these days. So let's just talk about, you know, how you see the history of, let's say, social media, smartphones, uh, and where we are today. Just bring us up to, bring us up to speed um, briefly, because it, I think it, it's telling, um, you know, about where we, how we got here. Well, you want the history of social media in in a minute or two? <laughs> I know you can do it. Well, way back when, when we used Gopher servers, <laughs> I mean, I was online. Uh, I, I was just talking on Tectonic this week with my guest, um, this artist named Ben Gross, who's a fellow Gen Xer, and we were reminiscing about the early days of the web when you would get on there were just a handful of websites and if you wanted to talk about something you would go to usenet which was this giant text only uh platform of of discussion boards basically and then there were some early attempts at social networking like friendster and myspace uh, and then facebook showed up and there's a great book if you want the, the a good single volume history of facebook which doubles as a history of social media, really, because uh, Facebook was, was such a pioneer in this area. Read the book, um, Facebook, The Inside Story by Stephen Levy. Stephen is a longtime tech journalist. Uh, he's been on Tectonic a couple of times, w w one of which was an interview. I interviewed Stephen about this book, Facebook, The Inside Story. And it tells how um, Zuckerberg, of course, started Facebook as a way to um, rate the physical attractiveness of his female classmates at Harvard um, in in a way that was non-consensual and almost got him kicked out of Harvard, uh, but somehow he survived that and moved the company out to Silicon Valley and and went went from there. And I just remember remarking to Stephen Levy that at every major decision point, it was like reading that book was like re watching a horror movie because at every major decision point, Zuck was presented with the right thing to do and really the most awful, horrible, unethical thing to do. And you're going, don't do it, Zuck. Don't do it. Don't do it. And of course, he chooses door number two every time. And Facebook then 
became gigantic. And at some point, uh, he fully embraced the growth at any cost ethos of Silicon Valley. And that means when you have any choice of either doing the right thing or doing something awful that will allow you to grow just a little bit more, you do the awful thing. There's, there's no question. And the, the, so, the, the, the story of social media then, you know, through his purchase of Instagram and, and rolling that into Facebook's practices, the purchase of WhatsApp, which he promised he would, he, he would have hands off, he wouldn't turn horrible, he wouldn't turn into a surveillance uh, machine. Of course, he, he ruined WhatsApp as well, um, which is why we now have Signal, by the way. <laughs> because the co-founder of WhatsApp felt so um, ashamed that he had sold out to Zuck that he, he, in his own words, is doing penance by creating an actually secure app now. Anyway, so uh, Zuckerberg's actions go in lockstep with this growth at any cost mentality in Silicon Valley, and that's led to many, many unethical decisions by him and his senior leadership, which have rolled out into terrible outcomes for people on the ground, users, families, communities. Um, many have, have argued that democracy itself it is now at risk worldwide because of uh, the actions of Zuck and other Silicon Valley execs. And so the, the history of, of social media is, is really one of um, gradual but inescapable corruption and full corruption into an obsession with growth and a, a, a complete shredding of, of any sense of decency or ethics. So you, then we end up with more recent revelations, like a couple of years ago, Francis Haugen went to Congress to talk about the, the Facebook, the so-called Facebook files, in which he uh, revealed through leaked documents that Zuckerberg and his senior leadership knew they knew they had internal research within Facebook that 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 and, and Instagram that that proved that these services are harmful to teenage users, especially teenage girls measurably harmful to their mental, physical, emotional health. And when presented with this data, Zuckerberg every time would say, keep going, do it more. We need more growth. Not a, not a whit of, of any sense of ethics about, um, about the, the negative outcomes that his products were having on people. And this to me, you know, I said at the beginning of the interview, I've worked for over 20 years as a consultant trying to help teams make their products better for the user, better for communities, better because I firmly believe if you make products better in the long run, everybody benefits. But Zuckerberg and his, his cabal of, of investors and fellow CEOs in Silicon Valley, they take the opposite approach. Don't make it better for people, make it grow faster. And don't worry about any negative outcomes that it might cause for people. And so that's why we have ended up with, with such terrible outcomes. And um, people say, oh, I hate Facebook, but I have to be here because all my friends are here. Or I know I probably shouldn't use Instagram. I keep doom scrolling on this stupid phone all the time, but I can't stop myself. That's by design, you know? And so I'm hoping that um, through my work, on the radio show and my consulting and the creative good forum my writing um, that i can help bring a little bit of, of awareness to this that'll encourage some people to step away from that got it so it's not just facebook right there's other players right so what about you know the latest the latest sensation is TikTok, right um how sure. do you view um and the, and the, having said that there's also there's more potential regulation coming online or pressuring the companies uh, to sort of be a bit more uh, protective of young people and, you know, um, minimize the downside risk. So how do you view some of those better late than never sort of uh, approaches that may be happening in, in, in our government and are happening overseas? 
mostly in Europe. How do you view some of the the pushback uh, against some of these downside risks that social media cause? And then let's get in, and then let's cover at least TikTok and and any other platforms that you uh, see. Well, first on TikTok, TikTok has perfected the addictive algorithm <laughs> um, through a combination of shorter videos. And I don't know what they have going on under the hood to figure out what people want to see next. Um, but as addictive as it is for people to watch YouTube with the autoplay, playing the next video and the next video, TikTok has an even faster uh, loop. So it's, it's quite addictive. Some people are um, concerned about the Chinese ownership of TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, and the close partnership between ByteDance and the Chinese Communist Party, which I've also covered on the show, is responsible for just horrific human rights abuses. And um, I've done a number of shows on the western region of Xinjiang, China, where over a million uh, Uyghur Muslims are, are locked up. It's just just in, in camps, awful, awful situation. Um, and they are oppressed by a surveillance state that is um, that has been constructed in part through American technology. So TikTok's um, partnership with the CCP that does things like this has people justifiably worried. Now they see that the CCP has a direct line into the minds, the attention, of a fair percentage of American young people. Um, and I, I agree with that. I'm, I'm concerned about that as well. However, I, don't, I wouldn't stop there because I always say, would you prefer if a horrible surveillance company that's based in the US is doing the same thing? Of course, which it is, you know, meta uh, through Facebook and, and even more uh, Instagram. Or, or Alphabet through um, Google YouTube with its reach into uh, uh, American teenage minds and, and, and attention spans. These companies have no more ethics than ByteDance does. I, I can assure you of that. The only difference is that they're sharing their surveillance data with the U.S. government rather than the Chinese government. Um, so, I mean, I guess you could root for U.S., governmental oppressive surveillance as opposed to Chinese, but I, I don't like any of these services. <laughs> I don't like it when there's an asymmetry of power, whether it's a government or a company that's using intrusive surveillance to, to spy on people outside of their awareness with, with no easy ability to opt out. Um, so that's how I put TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat, all these services basically in the same bucket. As for pushing back, the European Union has been the only legislative body that has consistently, over the last, let's say, five years, put teeth into its regulations. Some people don't like, um, you know, the, the the ubiquitous cookie pop-ups that we get now because of the um, GDPR, the EU regulation about privacy, a few years ago. Now every site you go to says this. This site uses cookies and you go yes i know every site uses cookies <laughs> and that is a little bit annoying but the they have issued fines they have forced the uh, big tech monopolists not to do certain things that they continue to do in the u.s they've just been a more effective regulatory body here in the u.s um the federal trade commission excuse me the federal trade commission is doing good work um, the Department of Justice has a very interesting antitrust suit going right now against Google, which I hope the DOJ wins. So there is some good federal activity, but really the, um, the most impressive work overall is coming from the states. So you have things uh, like privacy regulations, like uh, BIPA, the, the Biometric uh, Privacy Act in Illinois, or uh, the the California regulations about privacy that protect Californian citizens. So maybe we're going to see more states join in in those efforts to uh, to cut down the big tech companies' ability to, to surveil us 
on a state by state basis. And then we can all just choose <laughs> which state will be protected the most in since we don't have a whole lot of protection. There is, there still is no federal privacy law. By the way, if you want, if, if your listeners are interested to learn more about this, I'll be Charlie Brown at the end of the little cartoon. Go to your local library and get Your Face Belongs to Us by Kashmir Hill, who's a New York Times uh, reporter. Or you can go to tectonic.fm and listen to my interview with Kashmir just uh, a few months ago talking about Your Face Belongs to Us, which is a great book about uh, uh, facial recognition, but more broadly about the surveillance that we're subjected to every day and uh, how there are there are states that are pushing back on this. Got it. And so, <clears throat> so there is some progress from the states. Okay, that's good. Um, Snapchat, how do you view Snapchat? Also ran. <laughs> I don't think I don't think they're that um, significant, actually. I think that the come in the same way that Twitter, uh, before Elon Musk took it over, Twitter, it was just a fraction of the usage of Facebook. So if, if you want to take the temperature of what's happening at social media, you look at Facebook, you look at Instagram, you look at TikTok. Um, it's not to say that Snapchat is, is going out of business or anything. It's just they're a small player. And, and Twitter slash X is also very small and seems to be shrinking player. I think it's only significant um as a service to watch how far musk has has fallen uh, and the kinds of people that he's he's attracted you know like bring bringing alex jones back onto twitter which he did recently i just i think that speaks volumes that he would he would open the door to alex jones so you know as a as a case in point of how um how bad things have gotten you can look at Twitter X, but if if you want to if you want to study the companies that are really defining the social media era, such as it is, it, I think um, Instagram and and TikTok and also uh, Google's YouTube, see what they're doing as well. That those those three are probably the, the ones to watch. And you mentioned Signal before. <clears throat> what about Telegram? Telegram is another um app like signal that is that promises to offer secure communication between sender and receiver the difference between telegram and signal is that telegram is not open source it was um, created by a russian engineer um, who i think wanted to bypass some of the russian surveillance state but the code base has never been released, so it's hard for security re researchers to say with, with any confidence how secure that, that app really is. Um, I'm not a security expert, so I can't, I can't say much more than that definitively, just that from what I've read, it seems like Signal is probably a, a, a better bet. Although even that, um, the, look, there's, there's no, use, use a, a, I'm just holding up mine, Use a handheld surveillance device known as a, a smartphone, you're likely to be surveilled. And so if you really want secure communication, uh, put your phone in the next room and go, I mean, go go walk in the park and just hope there are no microphones on the trees. <laughs> That's a little conspiracist of me, but um, yeah, the the most secure communication is the communication that does not go through a digital intermediary service or, or device. Right. But you say that, and um, that is serious about surveillance, even out in the open, right? I mean, obviously China has millions of cameras and that's a surveillance state, but I, I think we have um, a lot of cameras in this country too, right? Huh. I just did a story. You're based in New Jersey, Jim. And I just did a, um, or did a, did a tectonic show with Jason Kebler, who's one of the co-founders of 404 Media. This is a, a new news site um, where they're covering surveillance and other tech-related topics. I like it a lot. And Jason had broken a story about how the state of New Jersey was found to have bought, uh, to, to the state of New Jersey 
used COVID funds, used COVID relief funds to buy surveillance cameras built by Dahua, which is a Chinese surveillance company that has been banned by the U.S. government because of its complicity in human rights abuses in China. So basically, New Jersey citizens right now could be surveilled by Chinese cameras, thanks to the state of New Jersey using COVID funds in order to do that. It's a, it's a pretty wild story. This is all to say that we um, Americans have no idea the level of surveillance that they're subjected to. It, it's not like everyone is aware of it and we have had a thoughtful national conversation and we've decided somehow, I wouldn't agree with this, but we've somehow decided that 10 bajillion surveillance cameras watching our every move and our location and everything um, is worth it if we get a smidge more security in our society, which of course is not true. But, but Jim, we've never had that conversation. Most Americans are totally in the dark as to the level of surveillance that they're subjected to, both by the most powerful companies in the world and by their own government. And I mean federal and state and local. If people were aware of the amount of surveillance, the, the, the level of an intrusion that these companies and government agencies have into their lives, they would be horrified. Once in a while, you, you see a news story that says, did you know that X? And people go, oh, that's crazy. Um, but it, it's, happening, it's happening everywhere. I know we're going to talk about C CES, but let me just say one thing about CES. This CES was full of these um, car companies talking about their smart car technology that they're launching. And here's a, a little rule of thumb I've, I've pointed out in Tectonic a bunch over the years. Anytime you hear the word smart, like smart car, smartphone, smart vacuum, just replace smart with surveillance. And now you understand what this thing is. It's a surveillance car. It's a surveillance phone. It's a surveillance vacuum. And I'm not, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being flippant. I'm not kidding. That's what these things are. In fact, there was a surveillance vacuum that was announced. Um, that was that was uh, it was announced at CES. It was highly criticized by privacy advocates. But anyway, these car companies are coming out and saying, "Now you're going to have a smart car," and I say, "No, it's a surveillance car. It's loaded down with cameras, microphones, sensors, and they're all sending data back to some mothership to be rendered, processed, and added to your personal dossier that you have no access to." That's going to be monetized in ways that you would not like, uh, sent to your insurance company or possibly bought by uh, contractors that then feed it into government agencies. So Mozilla did a privacy report of car company privacy practices just last fall, and it was just incredible. They, they said every car manufacturer that they studied got a failing grade. By the way, you know, of all the, and they, they, they listed, I don't know, 12 or 15 different car manufacturers. You know, Jim, can you guess which car manufacturer got the worst privacy rating by Mozilla, which is known for its rigorous privacy work? What, what car company has the worst privacy rating out of all of them? You guess? Uh, BMW. No, it's Tesla. Because when you think of smart cars, that is to say surveillance cars, Elon Musk is on it. Uh, but so Tesla is the worst. I mean, it's capturing data about you left, right, and center, and it can do whatever it wants with that data. But also one of the bad actors of all companies was Nissan. And one thing stuck out to me about Nissan, they say in their privacy policy, um, we have the right to surveil your sexual activity. Wow. Are you ready to buy a Nissan? It's like, when, when did we wake up in a world where in order to buy a car, you have to sign away your rights in some obtuse um, terms of service agreement that even a lawyer couldn't parse that says they're going to be doing all kinds of creepy spying on you in your life. You have no, you have no right to do that. But when every, but Jim, when every car company consolidates into these same unethical practices, where, where's the escape? We're all going to have to go find used cars from 
the the from the latest year before they started this creepy stuff i don't know when that would be 2003 or something and uh and and try to keep those old cars alive the ones that don't have microphones hidden on on the inside right oh my god that is scary now what about ai that's uh, all the buzz about ai as you and i both know uh it's been around for a long time it's just uh the hype has caught up with the actual consumer penetration at this point with generative AI and chat GPT. But t- talk to us about uh, how you view AI and, and generative AI. Okay. I have written an email newsletter at creativegood.com for over 25 years. It's one of the longest email newsletters running in the world. And I try to write it every week or two, send out a long column that gives my thoughts on on something. And I have been writing about AI over the last few months, trying to work out for myself, what what is this? What is AI and what is generative AI? And how can we understand it? What is it really? And one of the first things I wrote, going back to my perspective that I always have about, is this good for people? Not is it going to create growth? Not does it look cool? Is it good for people? Does it help? And so I wrote a column about that started by talking about an old uh, f- uh, investing book called Where Are the Customers' Yachts that was based on this old story of an investor going down to Wall Street and seeing all of the yachts of the, uh, of the uh, executives at the Wall Street firms. And he said, that's great, but where are the customers' yachts? And so I wrote, a, I wrote a column called, Where Are the Customers' Bots? Be, with, with a simple question, all of these chatbots and all this generative AI, it, it sounds so cool and neat, and the companies are obviously excited because they're going to make money, but where is the use for customers? Why is this good for us? I think that's the frame, gem that we should start. Anytime anyone says anything about AI, that should be the frame. Wait, wait, wait. I really could not care less if Google or Meta gets another quarter of growth out of this new buzzword. I really do not care. What I do care about is, is it good for people? Is it good for communities? And I think uh, to, to step away from my doom and gloom for, for just a moment, I do think that occasionally there are going to be some mildly useful outcomes of generative AI. I wrote a column a few weeks ago called AI is Spackle. If you've ever uh, fixed a, a, a hole or a nick in drywall, you need to get some of the gray goo and you spread it on with one of those metal things. <laughs> and it's helpful. You know, it kind of fills the hole and, it, and you can paint over it and it's okay. And I think generative AI can work as Spackle. If you really need some filler text somewhere, or if you're a programmer and you really need it to spit out a certain search algorithm that you have coded a bunch of times before, but you really need it very quickly, it's spackle. You know, just just give me a little gray goo and I'll spread it on. The problem, Jim, is that Silicon Valley is never satisfied with being a low-level helpful tool. They need to present themselves as the saviors of humanity and the most cosmically brilliant, eternally praised demigods of the cosmos. That's the only kind of language that is going to fulfill their their giant ambitions that will somehow make make sense of their lives for for their very, very needy egos. That are, that are so impoverished uh, out there that they need to talk like this. But anyway, AI then cannot simply be spackle. And AI cannot be framed as how does it help an average person. It has to be presented as this colossal, amazing thing. And therein lies the problem because it's not, again, it's not that AI is bad necessarily. It's that when you present it as something that's much bigger and more important than it actually is, is it's going to fall over at some point. And so I think that the reality is that um, AI very often 
is is the the term is used to deceive people into thinking something is better more powerful or more important than it actually is meanwhile there's such enormous resources being put into the rollout of of ai and here i'm just just look at the large language models the amount of the amount of energy and water jim water that it takes to cool the servers uh, there are communities in the U.S. that don't have enough access to clean drinking water. Their municipalities are handing over their water to big tech monopolists to cool the servers so that they can come up with more training or, or more usage of their generative AI systems, which is wrong. That's just, that's not a good trade. That's wrong. And so Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, just spoke at Davos, the the World Economic Forum run by Klaus Schwab out there in Switzerland that comes every uh, January. And Sam Altman was asked this a similar question, what's the future of AI? <laughs> and Sam Altman said, well, one of the things is um, our AI system, um, this is not a direct quote, but it was, you know, paraphrasing, our AI systems right now are drawing down so much um, so many resources, by which he means ener primarily energy, but the water's in there as well. They're taking up so much um, energy that, now fill in the blank here, you're the CEO of OpenAI, Open AI, and you say, our system, which by the way, doesn't do everything that we claimed it would do, is sucking down so much energy, we are going to what? We're going to make it more efficient, or we're going to step back. We're going to reevaluate, or what? what you know, how would you how would you finish that sentence? Here's what Sam Sam Altman said: <laughs> Our AI system is drawing down so much energy. We need a breakthrough in nuclear fusion to generate more energy for us. I was like, that's remarkable, that that's your perspective, that. Your, your system that already is so disappointing and is already hogging all the energy that could be used and the water that could be used for better purposes. And your response is, we need a miracle to occur so that we finally crack the code on nuclear fusion to create enough energy, which by the way, will just be used for us. It's like, I can't, how is he not laughed out of the room? But, you know, everyone claps. Oh, Altman, such a genius, such a genius. Amazing. <clears throat> uh, that is an amazing stat or amazing comment um, about the energy usage. We just don't think about that. It is extraordinary. Um, but you say it's spackle. But there are downside risks. And as you know, I... I speak about this, you know, about misinformation, about, you know, deep fakes and, and, and elections and uh, extortion. Um, those are some of the downside risks I see and that concerns me uh, a lot. Um, and of course, the potential job losses, right, are concerning too. How do you view those sort of other issues that are the unexpected or negative side effects of, of AI? Well, sure. I mean, generative AI. There are there's there's already pressure on journalists. Places like CNET have tried to um, lay off actual human journalists and plug in ChatGPT or some sort of chatbot to write to write their stories. the The plan being, okay, we are all in on growth at any cost, so. Uh, we're being held back by paying salary and benefits to human jur journalists. So let's let go of those and let's have a chatbot write the stories, which probably nobody reads anyway. So um, that'd be great. I mean, what kind of, mm. again, remarkable that this would even pass muster for, for a second in a boardroom. And yet a number of news organizations tried this and, and it's a problem for journalists. Similarly for, um, for graphic artists whose works have been used to train the uh, the the engines like Dali and others, Midjourney, um, and can now spit out 
very mediocre, uninspired um, derivations of their work without them getting any compensation. That's just wrong. It's ethically and morally wrong for that to happen, and yet it's happening. And so artists are under pressure. But there's a larger reality reality here, Jim, that I want to point out, which is that the the advent of large language models was not the beginning of exploitation of writers and artists and and other professionals. This this um, uh, this practice of unethical exploitation and consolidation of power has been going on for years. I mean, I talked about the moment that I began to see the technology industry starting to get rather toxic was in the early 2010s. Um, the consolidation of the tech industry into four or five main players, Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, has resulted in a concentration of wealth, power, influence uh, that we, we have never seen ever as a species. We've, there has never been this concentration of power um, in so few hands before. And that concentration of power, that asymmetry of power always, always leads to bad outcomes. And so I'm concerned about AI, but I'm more concerned about the companies that own AI because they have been acting poorly for years, even before AI became a thing. And so <coughs> my suggestion is that we do something about those companies. That's why I'm so excited about the Department of Justice antitrust suit against Google. If they really score a, 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 a great victory, possibly we could see Google broken up. That could start a, a, uh, a round of breakups of big tech companies, which we, which we seriously need. Uh, we could look at significant fines. I don't mean the dumb little, oh, you owe us a billion dollars. You know, let's see some real fines for what they have done over the years so that it's, it's actually very painful to these companies. Um, how about the executives who've lied to Congress over the years? Let's see some perjury convictions. Let's see criminal charges. You know, so I, I just think the, the, the laser focus we have on the latest, greatest technology is important, but it's not the full story. I think the larger, the larger reality is that we should name the bad actors in our economy, which are the, the monopolies, and we should do something about those. And if we do that, then the use of their attendant technologies like AIs will, will start to take care of itself. Got it. And you mentioned CES before. Any other comments on, on, on the latest and greatest from CES? Oh, man. Where to start with CES? Um, well, Microsoft said they're going to change the Windows keyboard for the first time in 30 years. Woo. And what they're doing is they're adding a button called Copilot. It's like it's not enough to screw around with the on-screen user interface and have a dumb Copilot button on screen all the time. You know, how many times has Microsoft noodled around with Windows to put their latest dumb idea in programmers? I mean, from Clippy on, you know, Clip, Clippy lives on. Bad ideas uh, breaking up the flow of users has been uh, Microsoft's brand, really, for years. Anyway, so, but now it's not enough to noodle with on-screen UI, they have to put a button on the keyboard and they're not even sure what they're gonna use it for. Right now, all it does is launch Copilot, which is their their AI assistant. It's like Clippy, Clippy in the AI era. I, ca I cannot imagine how this is gonna actually be good for users. Again, the first question, how is this good for people? Not how is it gonna get Microsoft neato whiz bang headlines not how is it going to get microsoft a little more growth no 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 how is it good for people have we established that and we have not and so i think the best thing for people to do if they are presented with a windows keyboard that has a copilot button on it here's what you do it's very simple you take the keyboard you disconnect it from the windows computer and you walk if you're in new york if you're in manhattan you just walk west and eventually you get to the hudson river 
and you hurl the keyboard as far as you can into the Hudson River. And that fixes it. And I mean that metaphorically. I don't think you should feed the co-pilot button to the fishes because they would not appreciate it any more than I do. Take it to an e-waste facility. Uh, anyway, that's what I think of the Microsoft keyboard. And if you're in Iceland, maybe they're not in Manhattan. If you're in Iceland, I hear you have some active volcanoes. Walk over to the lava lake and just drop it in. And that you could drop the co-pilot keyboard in the lava because that would just melt it just fine. Got it. Um, now, what about, uh, you know, the Vision Pro and uh, VR, AR? What are your thoughts on that uh, technology and the latest moves by Apple? Well, um, Apple was not at CES, but they did <laughs> remotely give a uh, issue a press release saying, by the way, the Vision Pro will be uh, available for sale on, on February 2nd. And, uh, you know, good for them. I mean, Apple is hoping that they are going to uncover several more quarters of growth. Again, growth at any cost. Why it's good for people has never been established. Sorry to sound like a broken record or what's the, a glitchy MP3, I guess. What, what, sorry to sound like a repetitive algorithm, but why are these things good for people? Why are they good for people? I wrote a column back in June of last year called Rejecting the Apple Vision Pro. And you're never gonna guess what my take on the Apple Vision Pro is. <laughs> Um, but it's just interesting that it's called the Vision Pro, okay? And what you do is you strap this opaque thing over your eyes so you can't see anything anymore. It's just interesting how companies often say the exact opposite of what it actually is. So you, if you wear the Vision Pro, you're obscuring your vision. But knowing that you're going to look completely ridiculous wearing this visor in your living room, you know what they did? They turned the outside of the visor into a little screen and it shows a projection of your eyeballs on the visor and they're too far apart. And so you end up looking like one of those Star Wars aliens walking around. People walk in, ah, what is that? You uh, take that off. You look creepy. Um, and I think it was... Yes, it was Microsoft. I saw a screenshot that Microsoft, Microsoft always, no doubt you can guarantee they're going to do the dumbest, most mediocre thing they possibly can with a new technology. It's like clockwork. And hours after the Vision Pro uh, was, was released, hours or days, Microsoft came out with a screenshot. <laughs> and it showed Microsoft Excel on the Apple Vision Pro. And so what you do is you strap this thing where you look completely ridiculous called the Vision Pro, which obscures your vision. And in the floating in the middle distance, now that your, your connection with reality is, is all virtual and filtered through Apple's algorithms, now you see floating a window that shows an Excel spreadsheet. And then you have to say, wait a second, I already have a window with an Excel spreadsheet. It's on my laptop, which I can use with my eyes. And no, you're supposed to strap on a $2,000 vision obscuring rig so that you can look at a floaty Excel spreadsheet in the metaverse. I mean, none of this makes any sense to me. I don't understand. There's so many things we could use technology for. There's so many actual problems that people and community uh, communities already have that could be addressed by digital technology and these powerful processors and these vast data lakes and the algorithms we have and the talent we have in this country to actually solve problems. And what do we do? We come up with these stupid little visors so that you can look at a spreadsheet floating three feet in front of you. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, and the energy usage I'm sure is going to be is going to be colossal on these things. So again, let me put in my vote with Sam Altman. I really hope there's a miracle and nuclear fusion real soon so that we can feed it all to the big tech, greedy, power hungry systems. Uh, no, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. I think we should be deploying our technology resources elsewhere rather than a growth at any cost approach that torches 
democratic civil society in order that eight dudes can add uh, 10 more billion dollars to their net worth. But that's just me. Got it. All right. This has been great, uh, Mark. Great conversation. Again, so much to cover. <clears throat> We're going over time, but I really wanted to to hear your insights because they're, they're really, they're really smart. Um, so usually we do, uh, you know, just one thing uh, so that we get quick tips, uh, quick questions from our guests. So share with us just one thing, you know, one tip for people who want to protect their privacy online. Okay, this is really easy, Jim. At the end of every tectonic show, I say the same three words to listeners. Get off Google. And that's my one tip. I have more tips than that, but that's a great place to start. Stop using Google search, which, by the way, doesn't work anymore. Researchers have found it's, it's measurably worse than it used to be. So just get off Google. You can use uh, Kaji or Brave Search or DuckDuckGo. There's a bunch of options out there. Just get off of Google search. Stop using Google Chrome, which is spyware. Do not use Google Chrome. Switch over to Firefox. Um, even Apple Safari would, would not be quite as bad as Chrome. But I think Firefox is pretty good. And get off of Gmail. And that's, that's, that's harder for people to do, but it can be done. You can move to ProtonMail or FastMail, or there's a bunch of options. But just start trying to wean yourself off of using Google services a, a little at a time. Your privacy will in, uh, improve, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that there are companies out there that are not always trying to exploit you. Got it. <clears throat> um, the other question is, what's one tip for us so we can better balance technology or avoid addiction? If you, if you want to avoid addiction, just put the phone down. Put the phone down. And if you say, well, my Facebook is on there and I, it's always calling, my Instagram is always calling me. Delete your Instagram account. Delete your Facebook account. Just get off the services. Um, there's, there, there's, there's no substitute for, <laughs> for uh, deleting these accounts if you want to use them less. The, if you're using the app at all, they have a team of psychologists that are aligned against your best interests. You're not gonna, you're not gonna win that battle. So the best way is just to yank the cord and get off of those services altogether. And if you like social media, there, there are services like Mastodon that are uh, not for profit. There's not a monopolist running it. And you still can connect with people and, and learn a lot. I use Mastodon a lot, uh, but I'm totally off of Facebook and Instagram. I'm very happy about it. Got it. Okay, this has been great. Um, we usually end, Mark, with a poem or a quote or a saying from our guests. What do you have for us? Okay, this is a quote by Stephen Hawking. He said, Our future is a race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we use it. Awesome. And, and explain what that means to you and how you see it in your life. Well, you we can't deny the growing power of technology. I mean, we've spent this whole interview giving examples of platforms and companies that are growing and growing and growing. That's the other half of the sentence that's really interesting. The wisdom with which we use technology does not seem to be growing at the same pace. One could ask if our wisdom is, is growing at all. And you could even ask, are we making a concerted effort as a society to attain wisdom, to value wisdom, even to be aware that wisdom exists and, and can be reached for? So part of what I'm trying to do with Tectonic and Creative Good is to promote the idea that we can be more wise in how we choose the technologies we use and in how we build the technologies that we do build. The power of technology is going to take care of itself. I'm interested in helping us attain more wisdom. Great. Thanks again, Mark. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for joining us. 
I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.